Great. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for once again for this uh, beautiful day that you've given to us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We invite you. Uh, we ask of you to pour out your wisdom over us to help understand uh, the different way your your ways, Lord, as we study about ministry and youth ministry and leading uh, different aspects of ministry. Father, uh, help us understand and give us the grace that we need uh, to accomplish the things that you've called us for. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, thanks once again for joining in uh, for this youth ministry course. Uh, we will uh, we finished chapter one and chapter two in the last classes. Well, let's continue from chapter three, uh, where we will talk about uh, identifying our audience. Right uh, in your PDF, we will start from page eleven. I, th I think it should be the same page number. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll talk about identifying our, our audience. Um, so again, you know, like most of the sessions, I'd like to start with just asking you all the question, uh, as in why is, why is it important to for us to identify our audience um, in any different context? As an example that you can give, uh, can you think of? Uh, and um, tell me, why is it important to uh, know your audience, whom you are serving? Or whatever different scenarios or any examples that you can think of um i got some um, i work with a lot some a lot of youth in my team so it is difficult to identify them because some are quiet, some are reserved, and then you have to engage with sure. them based on, on on their behavior and on their personality. So it's, it's important. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mangi. Uh, anyone else? Anything else? And the importance of understanding your audience, uh, whom you are serving, or. Hey, so it's one of the examples that I can think of. Uh, this is again in, in context with uh, worship ministry, or if I'm leading worship, um, you know. So I have I, I've been invited to lead worship in a church uh, that is from a Methodist background or in a Methodist church, uh, for example, right? Um, so immediately I know who my audience is going to be. Now they are going to be, they would prefer more a traditional approach. They would prefer hymns uh, and uh, instead of some planet shakers and or his song thing, you know, full on heavy loud music running, sending electric guitars uh, and whatnot. That might probably freak them out and think I'm crazy. Uh, but uh, the point here is I'm going to lead worship uh, to a congregation, to a Methodist congregation. In other words, uh, I'm also going to serve them. And uh, for me to serve them well, I need to know my audience, uh, right? So uh, I would pick my set list or prepare my songs, choose my songs appropriately, which is, uh, you know, which, which will cater uh, to that kind of an audience, uh, you know, some mix of hymns and some old classics um, and introduce one song, maybe one new song. Uh, contemporary things so that they are not overwhelmed with all these, uh, you know, um, new, new songs, if, if I have to do it. Another context can be if I'm leading worship for a, 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 a youth meeting or a worship night, for example, which has a lot of young people per se, um, you know, we can still do hymns, but the whole, you know, 45 minute or one hour set is not going to be only hymns uh, to cater to that kind of an audience we are going to have a mix of different genres maybe uh, that will cater to that audience okay so basically just understanding your audience is key to serving them well and helps you uh, you know with your vision and uh, with your mission and helps you strategize um, right so those, those are the couple of examples so, so having you know, given those examples, uh, 
and is there anything uh, any other examples that you can think of in uh, um, why we need to understand our audience better a, 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 you know from your own experience from the career paths uh, that you've uh, been on uh, anything that you can think of and, and that you can share with us Yes, Christopher. Yeah, so I think it also applies also to the messaging and uh, you know the way the message is communicated. So if it is a if it is a youth uh, group, then uh, uh, you know the messaging will be uh, more aligned towards you know um, the uh, you know some of the um, messages that would apply to the youth, as well yeah. as how it is communicated, maybe in a more informal way, maybe in the, you know using a certain sort of some some uh, I want to say jargon, but you know some yeah. some uh, uh, you know words that are you know that they are that they are familiar with, and um, uh, making it you know more pal palatable to them you know when they when they, yes. when they actually hear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Christopher. Uh, anybody else? Just one more person, if you want to share from your experience. Yes, Asha, go ahead. Okay. Um, the importance of knowing our audience, and I like that because recently we were at APC Law College, we were conducting a youth this thing, and for some of them, they were feeling uncomfortable the way, like, and the others were so. For the, we have to see the perspective view of their side and also how we conduct ourselves, and also not to offend them, but to depends on the age groups, like they mentioned. And yeah, because some of them are like they don't like dancing, some like dancing, they're they have their own individuals and unique uh talents and other stuff. So, yeah, thank you. Right. So, is that more to do with the audience, or, uh, or, um, what is? Is it say individual choices? From your example, you're saying it could be a mix of both. Is that what you're saying, Asha? Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for sharing this. Uh, yeah, Mangi, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, just uh, like uh, to, add, uh, to add to Asha's, Asha's uh, uh, point, uh, mm -hmm. for example, in our church's youth, uh, we, even though it is one youth, yeah. however, there are different kids and different personalities. Some Some will be some will choose to sit in the lounge instead of worshiping right. with others. And right. we need to cater for for both those, right. the, the both both groups. So yeah, sure. it's like d d challenging and it's right. different at the same time. Sure. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, so it is important to uh, identifying our audience, who they are. But uh, I mean, I just want to share something towards maybe towards the end of the class, um, or at least this topic uh, on what we've just you know began uh, discussing. Right. So uh, let's just start talking about commitment levels. Okay. Uh, just that's where I want to begin, and why is it important to identify our audience? I think we've established very clearly that it is important for us to identify. Uh, who we are serving, uh, right? In the context of ministry, in our context, the youth. Okay. Um, so remember, we've spoken about uh, five purposes in our last class, which is uh, evangelism, worship, fellowship, discipleship, and ministry. Right? And so now that uh, you know we had these five uh, directions that we can go on, uh, you know. So another question that we need to ask, uh, we had to ask ourselves was. Um, one program can't fulfill all these five purposes. 
uh, to attempt to do a program which will fulfill all these five pro uh, purposes is like shooting yourself in the foot. It's uh, it's not a wise thing to do. Uh, so I, you know, so once we understand that, okay, one program can't fulfill all these five purposes. Uh, the next question that we can ask that we asked was, uh, who are we trying to target? with this program or with this youth meeting or you know with this combined youth meeting or with this outreach meeting who are we targeting so that is the question okay so uh, and and now you are narrowing down your audience and you are being very intentional about who you are trying to focus on because in a group or in a crowd of people say 25 30, 50, 100, 200, um, you are not going to please everybody because there are just too many different individuals who come in from different backgrounds, right? Say for in a classic youth meeting is if you have 50 people, uh, we are going to have at, at least five types of different youths, right? I'm saying at least, and the list can go on. So uh, who are they? Uh, you know, they can be a non-Christian, who's coming to the youth meeting for the first time or the second or the third time they are a non-christian but they are still coming because they are uh, they've been invited by a friend uh, you know they're contemplating their faith okay what do i do is this right for me you know etc etc so there's the non-christian youth there's a new christian youth who've just given their life to jesus who've surrendered who attended an altar call last sunday um, or they've just and you know been part of this faith for like a month or two or three months they are a very new christian they might not know a lot of theology uh you know they might not understand trinity they might not understand the holy spirit baptism and the gift of the holy spirits and the tongues and whatnot uh they might be in that zone uh and uh and they might you know there might be students or young people who are growing in their faith right uh and then there are youth who knows a great deal about the bible like you know they were born into a christian family they are raised in church uh etc etc or they've been faithful they attend every uh, weekend school ministry <laughs> uh etc so there are those young people who are who know a lot about the bible who are pretty strong in their faith and then there are those who are spiritual leaders itself okay uh i mean the list can go on uh, right, uh, you know, there can be young people who are coming to the youth meeting just because their parents forced them to be part of the youth meeting. Uh, it's like, hey, thank you for coming for the youth meeting. We welcome, uh, you know, so uh, who got you here? Yeah, well, no, I didn't want to come. I'm here because my mom wanted to be here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so you'll never know who you're going to get. Right? Um, so it's very important for us to understand uh, that at least in my context in our context at apc we need, it was very important for us to understand that one program can't fulfill all these five purposes now just because we have an objective and a purpose set before us uh, we have to be wise about it and you know strategize uh, how we how are we going to accomplish so in the name you know just because you know we want to uh, okay we have all these purposes we want to see evangelism happen discipleship happen fellowship happen worship and uh, whatnot all of this happen in one uh, event or one program uh, it's not going to be very successful uh, and people are not going to understand what you are trying to give them and it's just might not work okay so once you understand once you decide on who you want to target okay in this program this sunday in this youth meeting i'm going to target the new christians right who are new in faith so let me talk about trinity now uh you know so and uh, just kidding but you decide on a topic that would cater them that would equip them that you know that would kind of disciple them help them in their journey and becoming a better disciple um you get what i'm saying and or there could be another you know program where you say okay you know let's do an outreach program uh and you ask you tell your you know your young people who are christians spiritual leaders uh to invite their friends from you know their schools or colleges or workplaces uh and you make this like an evangelistic uh event or a program right so you are targeting the audience of who you want to minister to right are you are, are you following 
Okay, so now that once we've understood, uh, you know, it, who we want to target, uh, I mean, it just keeps growing and growing. Uh, you know, in, in the notes, you would see an image that is uh, mentioned. You know, you'll see circles, uh, you know, that says core, committed, congregation, crowd, and community. Okay, um, now that's just a brief diagram of that talks about the different commitment levels of the young people who come to your church the different commitment levels okay so as the commitment level increases the number of the group size decreases okay as the commitment level increases the group size or the size of the group will decrease Okay, so if you have, say, 50 young people in your church, uh, not all 50 of them are going to be in your core team. Not all 50 of them are going to be committed uh, in setting, a, you know, being part of the setup team or the sound team, uh, the ushering team and whatnot, right? There are those, and so that's what we are kind of, we will try and understand in this, uh, in this section, okay? So um, now this is a standard universal, uh, um, what do I say? Standard universal system in how they gauge the audience, uh, but from again uh, our experience and our observation at APC, it's a little unique. It's a little different. So we uh, we don't have all these five circles um, seen at at APC. So again, this is in context with APC and our young people. Okay. So on our observation, there were only three. One is the crowd and congregation, and then you have the community crowd. And then there's the core crowd, right? All of these different things are talking about the different audience, the different people that you are ministering to. Okay, so one, there is the crowd and the congregation audience. Who are they? They attend church. They may or may not have given their lives to Jesus. And they are shy or introvert, like they want to just you know, head home even before, you know, pastor says the benediction, right? Uh, pastor says, okay, let's all rise and close our eyes uh, and, you know, bring this to a, a close. Let's say the benediction. That moment you see all these people leaving out, the different doors, exits, and so you know, as they, <laughs> okay, so they are the crowd and the congregation people. That you know, we will tell them. Okay, you know, they're part of just, just, just coming to the church. They attend the church. They may have, may or may not have given their lives to Jesus. Um, okay. The next thing is the community crowd. They attend church. They are committed to growing spiritually. Uh, they volunteer in different aspects of the church ministry, and not necessarily proactive, but definitely interested in growing this is another crowd a set of audience right so they attend the church they are committed to growing spiritually that means uh, they could be plugged into a small group or a cell group uh, or a, a life group as we call it at apc okay so they're plugged into one of these small groups uh you know they want to grow spiritually uh they they are, they choose to volunteer in in different aspects of church ministry but they are not proactive what does that mean uh it means they are willing to help but then they will help when you go and ask them for help right that they are more reactive in in, in many sense right okay He's, you go and say it's like hey uh, mangi can you come and just help us with the sound it's like sure i'll be there i'll do that uh hey uh, asha can you come and help with ushering yeah sure pastor I'll come and do that right they are willing uh, but they are reactive, not necessarily proactive. That's one part of the crowd. Uh, and then there's the core crowd. They attend the church. They're committed to growing spiritually. They volunteer. Um, but here, they are proactive. They are committed to doing ministry. Right uh, now, they come up with proactive suggestions or ideas or plans or thoughts on how to make this area of ministry better. Like, uh, you know, they come to us and say, say, Elisha comes and say, hey, pastor, can we do this? And say, you know, I think if we do this, we can target this audience uh, better. I think if we do that, uh, you know, we can cater to this bunch of people better. I think if we do this. So you, you guys understand what I'm saying, right? Uh, they are very proactive. 
uh, and they are not thrown off or offended uh, you know by the fact that you uh, said no to their suggestion right the core the people in this core category are the kind of people where they are they keep giving you suggestions after suggestions and also if you say no to them their suggestions or their ideas they are not offended by the fact they say oh this pastor said no to my idea i'm gonna leave the church now <laughs> i don't like this youth meeting um no and so they would understand they're mature enough to understand okay and they are the kind of people who will immediately come back with another kind of so a suggestion or a solution. It's like, okay, Pastor, so what if we do this another way? Right? I hope you are following uh, with me for so long, and you, you know, and hope you're getting why it's important to understand the different categories of our audience and where they are at. Uh, yes, Christopher, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Oh uh, yes, no, so just an observation. I mean. Um... So I'm looking at the, at the uh, that uh, picture uh, of the concentric circles. Yeah. And the community is right at the, um, you know, right at the outward. Uh, yes. Outward circle. Yeah. But uh, you have put it. You have actually put it in the. Yes. Uh, in in the um, somewhere in the I mean close to four right. actually. Yes. Um, is there any particular reason for that? Because I mean I would have thought when I was reading this that you know crowd and community would be you know the attending church. And then right. congregation would be the ones that attend church and are you know committed to going spiritually. Um, right. And uh, you know there's there is no uh, committed because I mean I think you've you've sort of kind of merged the core. Merged, the yeah. Committed. Yes. So uh, again, yeah, like I mentioned, the uh, this is like the standard thing that is observed uh, around the world. Like I mean, they use this as an example. But like I said, uh, this might not work in every setup or every congregation or every church. It can be unique, right? In the way, uh, say for example, even the way the word community is understood uh, around APC and that you know the people of APC is very different from the way the definition was given for this uh, concentric circles. And so I, I've adapted, you know, that idea of concentric circle, and then just made it to our own for us to understand it differently. That's the only thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, once you, uh, you know, you and your team, uh, your core team, or whatever, you've made, you've observed, you know, you have, I'm, I'm just using the number 50 as an example. So week after week, you've had this 50 young people come for your uh, youth meetings Sunday after Sunday. And then you, you with the help of your team, you begin to gauge, uh, you know, where these individuals are. At. Or you, you can do it yourself as well. You know, say, okay, you know, so and so, so and so, so and so, I, you know, I think you know they come into this category, or they come under you know the community and the in the committed category, uh, the crowd and the congregation, or they have the potential, you know, to be as as a core team, uh, as a core member and whatnot. So and now that my my goal is is progression, is growth. Now in this context, when I say growth, it's not just increasing in number, but helping them move. Or progress from just being, you know, the church, uh, church attendee, uh, and making sure that they've given their lives to Jesus, and try to draw them in to become to be part of this community, right? Uh, so that's my another goal of where I want to work towards. So you 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 draw them in from the crowd and congregation to community, and then eventually from community to be more proactive, to be leaders, spiritual leaders and mentors, right? So you see, the thing is, it's like um, water con constantly flowing. Is the people who've come in from from the crowd and the congregation circle to community? That means more group would have another bunch of people would have filled in in that outer circle and then the as the community people come into the core category uh, that means people from the crowd in the congregation have come into community so there's this constant growth and there's this constant cycle and circle you know that's people are coming in they are growing uh, and then they're moving out you know and that's how youth ministry is uh, you know it's you, you <laughs> If you haven't realized, we are not going to be young people forever. <laughs> we're going to be a youth forever. So you know, there's always this transition transition that is happening. Uh, in my opinion, I think 
a, a good transition is uh, a healthy transition is every four years maximum five years uh, because um, that's, that's just my opinion because you are very easily outdated in this day and age uh, you're outdated in a day <laughs> uh, but yeah I think for uh, tops five years is a, is, is a good time to be a you know a pastor or a youth leader and whatnot and the transition needs to happen it keep it needs to keep moving on to be healthy and to grow okay um so it's very important that you identify and engage the different kinds of young people at your church and see where they are at okay uh, you can use this conference concentric circles uh, and adapt it to your own church uh, and you know gauge where each individual at and see how you can help them uh, to grow okay um so reaching and keeping the crowd and congregation youth what are some of the things that you can do uh, to not just reaching out to them but to keeping them right um you know some of the things you can do is make sure you have a program to which you your regular students can feel comfortable inviting their community uh, friends there's the service will have christians and non-christians um and you know small groups are a great way to nurture these kind of crowds and whatnot so i mean you can think of your own strategies and ideas that you can come up with um right for and and also for community youths uh, encouraging spiritual habits through small groups of the congregation have consistent time with god through prayer and bible uh, you know various topics that you can think of that can help uh you know that this community people will uh will 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 grow into becoming uh, core team members eventually okay um so that's chapter three very simply in understanding uh, uh our audience okay uh, do you, does anybody have any questions or thoughts so far that you want to share anything Tarun, Prabhakar, anyone? Simran, Kishan, any questions? Yes, Christopher, go ahead. Oh, yes, yeah, so uh, you mentioned about reaching and keeping crowd and crowd congregation and um, um, preparing community youth. Uh, just a question. Uh, Typically, um, uh, one of the, I mean, I think one of the things is that, you know, it, it possibly could be, a, you know, a, a trend where, uh, not not exactly a trend, but there could be a possibility that, you know, that people from the community may go back into the crowd and, you know, there may be some yes. kind of a dynamic aspect in this. Yes. Um, and there may be reasons for, you know, why that is happening. Yes. Uh, particularly when it's, you know, I mean, if it is coming closer to the court, then of course, you know, we know that other, you know, you yes. know that the, the messages are, are effective, the programs are effective. Yes. But what could be some of the reasons for, you know, to go back, God, for it to sort of, you know, kind yeah. of, I, in a way, backslide. Yes. And um, uh, yeah, so that is that is one question. The second question is um, in this, uh, in this uh, sort of um, need to, you know, to keep, um, keep the, crowd and congregation and move them into the court. What is the kind of timeline that usually have I mean, what is the sort of average timeline that yeah. that that, uh, that 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 is actually uh, sort of takes place uh, uh um, sure. yeah just a question on that yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you. I think a very valid and genuine question. So, yeah, uh, so it is possible, absolutely possible, uh, for people say in the community circle to move out. And to just be again go back to being part of the crowd and the congregation uh, and the reasons can there can be various reasons uh, uh, that could be related to the leadership or or that can also be related to the you know individual itself right so for example um, so the leadership has done everything to draw them in from the crowd and they brought the part of the uh, you know life groups or cell groups they, uh, they are helping volunteering and whatnot but due to their a lifestyle a personal lifestyle a secret lifestyle or there could be certain habits or whatever uh, could be the reason they might just backslide or they might choose not to be part of it after the leadership has done everything they can so what are the, some of the things that the leadership can do to keep them in is again 
uh, just keeping in touch with them, constant uh, say for constant follow up with them, just checking on them, you know, saying just dropping a message saying how are they doing, catching up with them for a coffee, uh, and and whatnot, right? Just to make them know and feel that they are valued, that they are seen, they are heard, um, you know, the, and that there is a leadership that actually cares uh, for them. And so all of these things, uh, I mean, the list can again grow to the number to the things that we can do as leaders to keep them. Uh, so after having done all of this, uh, you know, if they still choose to go back and that's on them personally, and that doesn't mean we stop pursuing them. We just still continue to do what we are called to do. We pursue them. We say, okay, hey, what's happening? You know, I didn't see you in life group this Sunday. Is everything okay? Um, you know, what's happening with family and all of that. And the, the thing is, the, is you don't stop pursuing. Uh, once they move out of the circle, you, the goal remains the same, is that you want to help them grow, uh, nurture them, and equip them. Um, right, so the, the reasons can be various. It could be, and from the leadership perspective, the reason why a young people might go move out to just be part of the congregation or the crowd is there was no constant follow up. Uh, I attended the church. Uh, I've been coming to the youth meetings for three months. Nobody came and spoke to me. I don't know anyone. Um, I feel lost. Uh, you know, there's a there are a lot of clicks. You know. Uh, okay there's a certain group of people only hang around with them i don't feel welcomed so you know all of this is part of can be the reason uh, you know of why an individual can go back uh, into just being part of the crowd you get what i'm saying right so it's both ways um, so it's very important for us as leaders to create a healthy culture of making everyone feel welcomed and whatnot. We'll talk about this uh, much later, but that's one of the reasons. And the timeline that I would give for the transition for helping, you know, people come in from one uh, category into another. Again, it depends on the individual. Uh, you know, is, there's no point in me giving a timeline for myself because I, you know, saying, okay, Roshan, in the next three months, I want this individual to come. It will not work like that because every individual are in a different season, different age, different stage uh, in their lives. And so you kind of got to work with them and work around them. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't want to give like a definitive number, Christopher, and say, okay, this is three months and whatnot. The sooner the better, uh, but we also have to be practical and realistic, saying every individual is very different, and so you work with them very differently. Okay. Right, right, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, just, uh, I guess, a question, I mean, maybe you'll talk through it, uh, you know, in some of the uh, later classes, but was there any program that you felt was, you know, maybe not effective and, you know, you kind of decided that, you know, you, that you wanted to kind of discontinue it, didn't make any, it didn't really have that impact that you wanted. Do uh, you have any example for that? Uh, no, Christopher, because in my, as in my tenure as a youth pastor, uh, so I was, uh, I was a youth pastor for four years and in which two years went in COVID. So we didn't really get a lot of chance to explore and uh, try different things. Uh, so you know, for in the two years, we we had to improvise and uh, have all our youth meetings online on, over Zoom. Like the whole world adapted, we also adapted for that. So, uh, but otherwise, we kept them. Once we restarted, we had our monthly youth meetings and combined youth meetings. So this, yeah. It was very little time for me to gauge if something worked or something didn't work, honestly, um, due to COVID and whatnot. Yeah, you're welcome, Christopher. OK, uh, any other thoughts, any other questions? Uh, yes. OK. So, Pastor, just oh, wanted yeah. to know, like you just mentioned about COVID post and pre-COVID. so. You worked on an individual before COVID. You found that significant positive change. But post COVID, again, you see a, yes. you know, fall away or a, maybe a backslidden. Yeah. So uh, has that happened like in that group? Or yeah. may, have you gone through like uh, such an experience with the uh, individuals? Everybody go. Everybody will go through that, Avni. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, 
Yes, that that is the reality of uh, is being in ministry or leading young people in our context, because um, they are constantly facing something or going through something, uh, and you know they might be just be going through a phase where they want to be left alone. Um, so I can't just put a tag and say they're backslidden because they might just feel like they want to be alone, and they might not necessarily be doing anything wrong, you know, in that period. Uh, but what I've uh, in, again felt that is very useful and goes a long way is just a simple message, and you know, saying like, "Hey, how are you doing? It's been a while. Uh, hope everything is okay." Um, and I can't tell you the impact just that one message will have, and they will remember you for a long time to come. So, um, as leaders, what is important is that to be just pursue them. You know, keep in touch with them, check on them, how they are doing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's very, very significant. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I'll just very quickly share from chapter four on the organizational aspect uh, of the youth ministry and the way it's set up uh, at APC. Okay, um, so if you look at your notes in the PDF, page 14, um, then that, the structure that you will see is uh, there's a senior pastor who's Pastor Ashish Raichur, and then the youth pastor will report to the senior pastor. And uh, and under the supervision of the youth pastor, uh, you have the, the core team, the operations team, um, the creative team, the core team leaders, members, youth life groups, and then youth, youth worship coordinators, just the different teams that will help, um, you know, uh, work together with the youth pastor to accomplish um, the vision and whatnot. So this is the way that it's uh, set set up uh, at, the, at the moment, okay? Um, the operations team, what they do, what they do is they take care of all the operations. For example, if there's a combined youth meeting that's happening, uh, all, they will coordinate with about all, everything that's related to the logistics, uh, from setting up the sound and the venue and whatnot. And the media team or the creative team will have the lyrics for the songs, the sermon notes, uh, presentation, any videos to be played, uh, all of that. Creative team can also involve, uh, you know, dancers, you know, and painters, um, et cetera, et cetera. A youth life group coordinator uh, is making sure that, okay, all our young people are connected to some life group somewhere, um, right? And then there's the youth worship coordinators who coordinate every aspect of worship uh, for youth meetings uh, with the worship pastor and whatnot. So these different teams to help. Uh, just it helps us become be very clear. So as a youth pastor, I'm not you know now that I've delegated, my hands are not everywhere. You know, um, you trust them to do their job, <laughs> the, the the teams to do their job, um, right? So that's the basic structure. Um, the role of the pastor, uh, you know, in the organizational aspect is that he provides the general vision. He gives the general direction and the motivation. He shares his goals for the youth ministry. Um, right. So uh, in my initial meetings uh, with Pastor Ashish, uh, he would share, okay, say, Roshan, we want to reach out to the youth in Bangalore City. We want to equip them. We want to uh, be able to empower them. Uh, equip them is you disciple them and then you also empower them to go and share the gospel in the city of Bangalore, wherever they are. Um, so that was his general vision, uh, you know, his direction, and he would constantly motivate. So that's the role of the the senior pastor, uh, right? And it is very important for us uh, who who's under the supervision of the senior pastor to constantly meet with him and check and give him an update and saying, okay, this so what's happening with regards to thing what do you think about it what do you want us to do etc cetera, etc cetera, right because he's the senior pastor uh, you know we are accountable to him he's accountable to god okay um the role of the youth pastor uh it, it can be intimidating uh, more so pastoring the youth um I, Guys, if any of you who've led young people, youth, a group of youth, uh, you'll know what I'm saying. It's very intimidating. Okay. Uh, I, I still remember the first youth camp we had in 2019. Uh, that's my first year of, as being a youth pastor. Uh, 125 people came for the camp. 
uh, I cannot explain the anxiety that was inside of me. Tarun was there at that camp. Uh, you know, um, I'm seeing all these three buses coming, and I'm seeing you know wave after wave of young people getting off of the bus, and I'm like. Oh Lord, what am I going to do? Help me out here, <laughs> because I have to meet with them. Because uh, naturally, as a character, as a person, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm an introvert. Like I like my space. I will not engage in a co conversation. You know, just I like my space and whatnot. But then, <laughs> you can imagine, guys. You, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay, it was just very intimidating. Uh, but you're the youth pastor. Got to do it. Uh, as int intimidating as it can be, uh, right? And also, pastoring simply means uh, shepherd, right? That's the word pastor comes from the root word shepherd. It means to guide, to provide, to protect, and care uh, for others through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You are constantly dependent on the Holy Spirit to help you, to lead you as you lead uh, the young people. Okay, so. Uh, the role of the youth pastor, number one thing is that don't forget that you are a pastor. That is, don't forget you are a shepherd. That You are to guide them. You are to protect them. You are to care for them as a shepherd would. Okay. Um, and some more key points uh, that, you know, that will help us with this in our journey is uh, have a strong team. Uh, if you can have a team uh, to help you to work with you, uh, you know, as, as you do, uh, you know, certain things that you have to do within the ministry. So have a strong team, like a core team, uh, you know, who lead the worship ministry, the life group leaders, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and 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 all of this. Don't forget uh, relationships uh, are key. Again, this is from my experience, is relationships are key. Uh, you know, the programs or the activities or the events are not more important than the individuals. Uh, very often, we can lose that focus and think, okay, it's all about the event. It's all about the event. But we forget why we are doing that event and who we are doing it for, like the audience that we are catering for. Right? We make it all about the events, guys. I know you what you know. You understand what I'm trying to say, but we need to just uh, remember that relationships are very important in uh, ministry, right? Uh, and this one simple stay, uh, you know, saying that says the youth don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now you can be this leader, this amazing. Uh, you know, pastor with a PhD and whatever degrees you want to add to it, and the, and your knowledge about whatever, uh, they will not be impressed by it unless they know how much you care, right? Because they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care for them. Okay, so uh, the role of a youth pastor is to be their pastor, care for them, uh, and mentor them, and most importantly. Um, in this journey, you rely upon God. Okay, uh, uh, rely upon Him, and uh, again, I, I hope you don't mind me sharing just another example of my personal experience. Um, is so you know the first year for the youth camp uh, again. Uh, I, I was seeking Him to you know uh, to give me a theme. Uh, I asked Him, okay, Lord, what do we do for in this year's youth camp? Give me you know. Uh, what what theme would you like to focus on? So he gave me a theme on encounter and whatnot. And then the second year comes, and uh, so in the first year, the first camp was uh, success. Uh, Tarun, what do you think for uh, success? <laughs> uh, the second year, you know, there was this sense of arrogance in me, saying, "Okay, hey, you know what? I've done one youth camp. I think I know how to do with another youth camp." And it creeped into me, and then again, God in His tender mercy, uh, and His grace, and His in His kindness, uh, He reminds me and says, "So you're not going to rely upon me this year." Uh, and 
our God is so good, no? I mean, such a good father that in a way that even he teaches us, he draws us into this conversation is so beautiful. And uh, that was a very humbling experience for me. And that where, you know, I would, I never want uh, the success of my experience to stop me from relying upon God. Uh, that's a uh, that's something very valuable that I learned in my journey as being a youth pastor. In the, and that's which why I'm sharing sharing the point here with us is uh, to always remain in the posture of humility uh, and relying upon Him in every step of the way. Uh, in every for every event for every meeting, uh, you rely upon Him to lead you to guide you as you shepherd uh, His people. Uh, rely upon him to shepherd you because he is the good shepherd right as the bible says okay so that's the role of the youth pastor uh, and um, there are certain points that are mentioned that is expected of a core team member uh, that a core team member should uh, attend a certain uh, you know meetings um, they will compromise of a few selected youth leaders from each location uh, core team members are requested to be regular at the youth core team meetings. Um, you know, uh, guys, please remember these are all the structural aspect of the youth ministry and what is expected of a youth uh, core team member if they are part of it. Okay, um, let's please go through it when you can. And at the moment, some of the events that's happening at APC, which related to the youth, are if you see in page sixteen. Um, MY, what we call as MYM is monthly youth meetings. Uh, every second Sunday, there's a, a, a monthly youth meeting happening at APC South. Third Sunday, there's a youth meeting happening at Central. And fourth Sunday, uh, there's a youth meeting happening at East and North location of APC. Uh, combined youth meeting, which we call as Pit Stop, is where the youth of all these locations from North, South, East, West, and Central come together which happens uh, quarterly or once in two months or once in three months uh, that's uh, what we call it as pit stop uh, there's a youth camp that happens once a year where we go off for three days for a time of worship and prayer and ministry food and games and fellowship and a lot of craziness and a lot of unexpected things to happen <laughs> a youth camp uh, who, who doesn't love a youth camp uh, Right, so youth camp, youth retreat. Again, it's a one-day getaway kind of a thing where we take our young people to an offsite and just uh, have a power-packed day with games and then again ministering to them on a certain topic and whatnot. Uh, we encourage them to go on youth mission trips. We once a year. Uh, we also have youth missions at APC where we take a bunch of young people and go to a location to a different city to uh, you know, give them a platform to minister to people uh, at a different city. Um, and then some of the campus uh, outreach programs that we have, what we call as Campus Elevates, we go into different schools and colleges. Um, we have an one hour inspirational program, uh, you know, which we give to the students of different colleges. Uh, and we have a lot of resources where we talk about different topics, uh, practical topics uh, that will cater to the students there. So these are just some of the events that's uh, programs per se that's happening uh, at APC um, with, with related to the youth. And uh, yeah, so that's the organizational aspect of um, the youth ministry at APC, guys. Okay, um, I hope everybody is still alive and doing well. <laughs> uh, we'll stop here. Oh, sorry that I've uh, gone over time. Uh, well, thank you for joining in. Um, I'll see you all on Monday. You guys have uh, a great week ahead. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.